If we pause to pay attention, it's nothing short of beautiful how God leads us in places and spaces that become their own kind of sacredness, from the tapping of toes and uh, swaying and the music with our youth choir very profoundly leading us and opening up our worship. Thank you very much. Can't wait to see the choir next week uh, move into some of that inspiration to our uh, uh, to our wonderful flute ensemble here, gathered here. But probably, in fact, not even probably, most assuredly more important than the music that dazzles our hearts and uh, uh, stirs up our imagination or the cerebral pausings that we have as we are being challenged uh, through scripture and inspiration. What's most important in our gathered worship is just simply being here. You and I showing up, daring to believe that because when we gather in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, God actually joins with us. And that should be enough to stagger anyone's imagination and fortify whatever it is from this point forward we must face. Because this today and in the weeks ahead, we're going to focus on what it means to risk something big to risk our very lives, to risk something big for something good. And life is a risk. You and I have survived this far because of great risks, whether we realized it or not. We cannot avoid it. And so why should we not help but to risk something magnanimous for this precious life we're living? To guide us in this journey this morning, I invite you to look with me in your Bibles to Paul's letter to the church of Philippi. It's a beloved letter that he writes to a congregation that means much to him. And I'm going to simply read uh, one verse, even though that I realize that that risks taking it out of context, but I assure you, I think it's very central to his thinking. Paul writes, I am confident of this. That the one who began a good work among you will be faithful to complete it by the day of Jesus Christ. These are God's words for God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In your holy mystery and our everlasting wonderment, O oh God, we are here taking the chance that you will continue to show up and show out in our lives. And so now we pray open our minds and our hearts and our lives in a way in which your spirit will move through and within us that we will leave here differently than when we entered. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In a meeting with... Um, with Logan and David months ago kind of talking about this idea of let's lead the church in kind of a stewardship theme of sorts. And I know, I know, all joking aside, we, you may be sitting here thinking, this was a Sunday I meant to skip. Well, I show up on a stewardship Sunday or a stewardship theme. But um, uh, before you hang on to your pocketbook or your wallet, let's Let's ease into what we mean by stewardship, what it means to be accountable, responsible. And it begins and ends with our very lives. And I've, I've loved this, this uh, uh, you could call it a poem, but it's really more appropriately a benediction by William Sloan Coffin from which we get our stewardship theme this year. I'll just simply read it to you. It begins familiar enough. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. You hear that every Sunday at the conclusion of worship. But Sloan Coffin goes to offer the words, May God give you grace never to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth, too small for anything but love. So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips 
and speak through them. And may God take your hearts and set them on fire. Now, brothers and sisters, that's the kind of stewardship I want to live into. In the beginning, God spoke And the world and all we know it came into being. God breathed the breath of life and humankind came to be. And now through the ages, God continues to breathe, to inspire, to ignite in each and every life, yours and mine. And including this gathering, this curious gathering we call church. And I also believe that Our creator God wants us to live into the good work first begun in us. Grace, as that benediction reminds us, to never sell yourself short. And maybe that is our lifelong challenge. We, in the end, sell ourselves short. Or to paraphrase Bonhoeffer a bit, cheaply. Oh, I know, life is a risk, and it's easy enough to come to church and play it safe. I've played that game a lot myself, still do, because I want to count the cost of things. But I believe that God has a desired future for each of us, what theologians might loosely call a will in our lives, at the very least a purpose for us. But I also think that it is our choice, our free choice, to decide whether or not we will live purposefully, willfully, to live risking generosity of life. Speaking for myself, I know that I have fallen short all of my life. I have fallen short as a father, as a husband, as a pastor, as a son, as a church member, as a follower of Jesus, I can count the many ways I have not quite risked enough. But the salient question really is for each of us, am I becoming the kind of person God wants me to be? So if you feel as though you have no idea how fallen short I am or have been, it's fine. The great thing about church and the great thing about life and the great thing about grace is it always begins with a clean slate. So okay. Relax a little bit. Lean deeper into the question, am I becoming the kind of person God wants me to be? Am I willing to risk generosity in my life that begins now? Now, we're used to thinking about generosity in financial categories, and I'm not going to dumb down our stewardship theme theme and make you think it's anything but money, but let's face it. If God doesn't have a grip on our lives, our money just becomes something easy. Anybody can write a check. You young people don't know what that is, but anybody can Venmo cash. Anybody can have a transaction in their account That's easy enough, but take it from a guy who has officiated a lot of funerals in my lifetime, who's held the hands of loved ones who've departed from this life, opening their eyes to the next, and who's even taught a course on death and dying. Life is too precious to miserly hoard it away. We only get this one life. We cannot wait until we graduate high school. We cannot wait until we get that career that has been the apple of our eye for some time. We cannot wait until retirement comes and then we can relax and do the things we've been wanting to do. We cannot wait. The moment is is now and it is about risking generosity of one's life. So as we look at Paul's letter to the church of Philippi, as I reminded our Wednesday night gathering when we were studying this epistle, Paul loves this church. It's clear. It's literally one of his beloved letters. Other letters in the New Testament that he's written, well, it's questionable. Not that he didn't love them, 
But at Corinth, he was upset with them. They were having worship wars. I'm sure none of you have ever heard about that. And then the church of Galatia was arguing over theology. Again, I'm sure that's not our experience. But there's something about Philippi. He loves this little church that began as a gathering of women worshiping God alongside a river. Simple enough. And in the very beginning of the letter, he writes to the church, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. I have long loved that one verse of Scripture. I've leaned into it personally and have to remind myself, oh, Greg, don't forget that one who started something in your life is not finished with you yet. The world may get finished with you. Your family may be finished with you. Sometimes churches get finished with you. But make no mistake, Greg, God who began something in your life is still working in your life. But I also have these other voices that remind me how short I have fallen. I think about the moms who struggle oftentimes to just measure up according to the standards of Instagram because their lives don't feel perfect and they are overwhelmed and they are looking in the mirror thinking, I'm not sure I am good enough. Or the student who is overworked and frazzled, uh, fearing that if they don't get this right or that right, their life is over. Or the elder adult, retired, widowed, lonely, feels the pain of no longer being useful to society. These words may sound good by the Apostle Paul, but sometimes we feel them very differently. Paul may say one thing, one who began a good work in you to be faithful to complete it, but some of us may feel used up already. And when we're convinced that when we're, when we are convinced that we are not good enough, no one else is good enough either. And that's what's insidious about all of this. Somehow it must begin with our own personal reckoning. No, God started something in you and it's not finished with you yet. And guess what? God's starting something in your neighbor and it's not finished with your neighbor either. And God started something with those whom you have called your enemy and God's not finished with them either. And God will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Eugene Peterson writes it this way in his translation called The Message. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that God who started this great work in you will keep at it and bring it to flourishing finish on that very day. Now some may see God as the grand mechanic or the great watchmaker as the deist would call it. Basically, God winds up the universe and lets it unwind on its own chart, leaving us completely alone. But I reject that. I think evidence all around us is that we're not left to be, to unwind into oblivion, but God is dynamic and on the move and the universe and everything in it and desired and hoped for direction. God has planted within each of us, and I love the children's message here, when in each of us a need to grow and flourish, not stagnate, but to blossom in wonderful and fruitful ways. In the letter to the church of Ephesus, Paul writes, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way. Are you committed to growing, to blossoming, to becoming the person God has created you to be? To not just stay here, but rather recognize there's so much more awaiting your one solitary precious life, as the poet um, uh, Mary Oliver would put it. Later on in the church of Philippi, Paul writes, Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I strain to what is ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Or in the book of Hebrews, we read, Let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race that God has set before us. 
So what stands in your way for the good work that God has started in you? What's getting in your path? Maybe it's what others have said about God that you're now discovering is no longer authentic. And so we're paralyzed by thoughts and constraints that others have placed on God in our lives. Or maybe it's the failures that you can't undo. And friends, we've all got failures we can't undo. We've made mistakes that we can't go back on and make better. And they can leave us paralyzed by our doubts. Or perhaps it's the unanswered questions that you brought with you into this worship space. And you know that when you leave here, you will still have unanswered questions. But here's how all this comes together. One's past is is not marked by failures, great and small. They don't uh, determine one's future. Grace, as the benediction puts it, never to sell yourself short. Or as Paul puts it, the one who began a good work in you. Now, here's something else I I want to point out about this this verse of Scripture and, and for our purposes this morning. Up until this point, I've been preaching it, and you've been hearing it as an individual charge. The one who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Ah, but let's go into the seminary classroom, brothers and sisters, and let me bring down the chart and point out the original Koine Greek and point to the word that says you and remind you that it is not you in the singular. Oh, don't get me wrong. God has begun a good work in you and you and you and you. But the scripture actually says in the Middle Georgian translation of the word, the one who began a good work in y'all. Or if you're from up north, the one who began a good work in you skies. Or if you're from the Appalachian Mountain, the one who began a good work in yearn, you know. Paul is speaking to the church. The one who began a good work in First Baptist Roswell will be faithful. I've been here since August of last year. I've enjoyed literally every Sunday, really have. But I know that it's been a very difficult season for the life of First Baptist. I know that many of you still grieve Uh, your pastor, Kevin Head's uh, resignation and leaving from here. You miss him. I've known Kevin for a number of years. He's a great person, worthy to be missed, and there's still grief work being done there. I know some of you feel upset, discouraged, or even angry about things in the past and wonder, what is my future with this church? I've heard you, and I understand you too. Still, perhaps, maybe most are filled with a bit of anxiety. I mean, I'm not sure what's going to become of this church. Who are we going to call as the next pastor? And by the way, I don't have a clue. I haven't talked to Mark today, so I don't know if we've got a latest update. It really doesn't matter. But I want you to hear these words of Paul as speaking not to our own personal piety, although I think that's important, But Paul is speaking to this church. Do you really think God is finished with First Baptist Roswell? Because if you think God is finished with First Baptist Roswell, here's the stewardship theme, you're going to approach church in a miserly fashion. And some do that. They withhold financial giving until things settle down a bit. Or they... Do not participate as much, saying, well, we'll wait till the real preacher gets here. Some are just simply on the uh, fulcrum of, of indecisiveness, not sure what to go. And I get that. Because when you're anxious, when you're afraid, when you're doubtful, you can't believe there's a future. And you start projecting that onto others. Ah, brothers and sisters. I believe the word of God. I believe Paul's words then, and I believe them in my life personally, and I certainly believe them for this church. The one who began a good work in all y'all will be faithful. 
So how can we not help but risk generosity to lavish this church and this community with everything we can? Because it, after all, is our gift right back to God. But if you're like me, and I don't want to presume too much, we want it now. We want it now. Yesterday, uh, a neighbor had invited us, a neighbor who's a friend, invited us to the Royal, well, let me back up and say, she works for Royal Oak Charcoal, which is based in Roswell, though they have plants in other states. And she said, we're having a national tournament where people are coming in all over the nation to grill. Would y'all like to come? That is such a silly question. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm happy to report no vegetables were cited. And, and I like grilling. And so it's just wonderful. You're walking down and you've got these people competing and they're saying, hey, would you like a rib? I don't mind if I do. How about some brisket? Absolutely. Let's have the chicken over here. And so anybody that does grilling understands the phrase low and slow. You can't rush things. You just let the cooking process and the magic of chemistry take its place with a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and gifts are given. Brothers and sisters, at the risk of making a crude analogy, it's about First Baptist leaning into low and slow with the promise that the one who began a good work will be faithful. Now, maybe individually you're going through too much in your life and you can't think collectively, and I get that. Maybe your life is a disaster and you're really questioning your future and, and you're just needing to come here to find that life preserver to hang on. I want this word to be for you. Yes, God has a future for you amidst your anxieties or your fears or insecurities. God has a future for you. But I also want us as a church to just hear that God's promises have been true from the very beginning of the created order and they're true for this congregation now. So my prayer is let's make this stewardship one of the most memorable yet. And sure, we can measure it with dollars, but that's the easy part. That really is the easy part, cutting a check, disp dispersing income and so forth. The real difficult work though is to leave here desiring to risk something something grand for a great God whom we serve. Let's pray together. Lord, life is far too short to live in any other way than courageously and boldly. And so we pray that as we bring this worship to conclusion, you give us the grace to never sell our lives short, including this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.